Thank you, Chairman Sullivan and Ranking Member Markey and members of the Subcommittee on Security. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the China challenge because it's, it's the epicenter of the economic security threat landscape. Last week in his landmark speech, Secretary Pompeo said, today we are sitting wearing our masks and watching the pandemic's body count rise. Reading new headlines every day of repression in Hong Kong and Xinjiang seeing staggering statistics of Chinese trade abuses, watching the Chinese military go stronger on the back of stolen American clean innovation. I've experienced the CCP's economic warfare firsthand. I grew up in small town Ohio where my father ran a five-person machine shop, and I saw China wield its weapons of mass production gutting my father's shop. His pain was not lost on me. I went on to be Vice President of General Motors where I learned when you build a plant in China to get access to their market, you don't just give them the blueprints, you give them the process engineering and train their labor force. I spent the rest of my career in Silicon Valley where I had my intellectual property ripped off and I saw firsthand China's strategy of seducing with money while reinforcing with intimidation and retaliation. I started the world's first B2B e-commerce company called Ariba. It's now the largest, seven trillion of commerce was conducted over the Ariba network last year. And I remember in the late 90s, we welcomed Chinese visitors to our headquarters, only to have them clone one of our concepts. That company was Alibaba. A couple years ago, while running DocuSign, I spent two weeks in China exploring what I thought might be market opportunities. I've been going there since 1981, but this time it was different. I met with Politburo members who spoke so passionately about their grand strategy for global domination, and I saw how cleverly they depositioned the United States. Then I got an in-depth look at their technology. That's when it hit me. As soon as, I get back, as soon as I got back, I went to Washington and spoke to anyone who would listen and asked, do you understand the country with the best technology usually wins? And that's when I was asked to serve. And that's why I'm here today, because of the China challenge. My first week on the job, Secretary Pompeo gave me the charge to develop and operationalize a global strategic plan that maximizes national security, combats Chinese economic aggression. The strategy we've developed consists of three pillars. The first is to turbocharge economic competitiveness by driving productivity and prioritizing 10 emerging technology uh, key areas that are critical to economic growth and security, such as 5G and semiconductors. China is also gunning for the lead in each of these as we speak. I can tell you the Communist Party's biggest fear is the United States would have a Sputnik moment. The second pillar of the strategy is safeguarding America's assets, including our intellectual property, financial system, and core freedoms. Securing these will require the U.S. and partners to demand reciprocity transparency, and enforcement of laws. We must also understand they've used our assets against us, including our openness and our values. We must view every Chinese action with skepticism. As Secretary Pompeo recently said, distrust and verify. The next part of the plan turns the table on the CCP by reclaiming our, our core freedoms as our strength. We will answer Secretary Pompeo's call to build a, a new alliance of democracies to oppose China. We would envision this to be comprised of like-minded countries, companies, and civil society that operate under a set of trust principles for all areas of economic collaboration. And those trust principles are American values. Things like integrity, accountability, transparency, reciprocity, respect for rule of law, respect for property of all kinds, respect for sovereignty of nations, respect for the planet, respect for human rights. When I talk to my counterparts from other countries about this concept, their reaction is, it's about time. We've been waiting for an alternative, as one of the Southeast Asian nations said, to China's one belt, one way toll road to Beijing. The new alliance of democracies represents a unifying and equitable clean alternative. And speaking of, uh, the clean. Let me update you on the State Department's clean campaign, which is unlocking a global movement. Secretary Pompeo also said last week, we've urged countries to become clean countries so that their citizens' private information doesn't end up in the hands of the Chinese 
Communist Party. And it starts with the 5G clean network. For years, the CCP has strong-armed nations to purchase Huawei's 5G infrastructure. Huawei is the backbone of CCP's surveillance state and extends the great one-way China firewall where data comes in but not out. And reciprocally, propaganda goes out, but the truth does not come in. The State Department is leading by example through our 5G Clean Path Initiative, which requires all data entering or exiting U.S. diplomatic facilities to transit only across trusted equipment. We're making a difference in encouraging our partners to join the 5G Clean Path and turning the tide against Huawei and toward clean vendors. As a result, Huawei's deals are evaporating. You saw it earlier this month with the U.K. and last week with France. There are now about 30 5G clean countries, and many of the most largest telco companies have become come clean telcos. Also recently, Telco Italia, Telefonica, the top three telcos in Singapore, and the top three telcos in Canada. So the clean campaign has been so successful that we're preparing to expand it beyond just clean networks and to clean systems, including clean apps, clean store, clean cloud, clean cable, and even clean currency. It's also important to have clean supply chains with clean labor. Recently, the State Department, uh, State Department joined other agencies to issue a business advisory regarding supply chain exposure to entities engaged in forced labor and other human rights abuses in Xinjiang. As I said in a follow-up letter to all U.S. CEOs, and their boards said, your institutions have a moral responsibility, perhaps a fiduciary duty, to establish clean governance principles and divest from companies that contribute to human rights abuses. They should, at a minimum, disclose the Chinese companies they invest in. Soon, President Trump's working group on financial markets will make recommendations to the president on the transparency of Chinese public companies to enhance investor protection and ensure American exchanges remain the gold standard for the world. So, Senators, in conclusion, tackling the many facets of the Chinese challenge will require all three branches of the government, our powerful private sector, and as Secretary Pompeo said, a new alliance of democracies. America's moment is now to choose a path, a clean path, to the future for the sake of our children and our grandchildren. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions.